The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Another back to school amidst a pandemic and the rules for students from kindergarten all the way up to college and university campuses differ widely. Tonight, some perspectives on that. First up, Ontario's Minister of Education, Stephen Lecce, will be here. Then, does the province still need COVID-19 mandates? We'll debate that. Plus, what post-secondary students hope to find at school this year. Season 17 of The Agenda is up next. Stephen Lecce has led the COVID-19 response in schools since the pandemic's beginning. He is the Progressive Conservative MPP for King Vaughan, and the Minister of Education joins us now on the province's plan to keep kids safe in schools amidst a pandemic that's not over yet. And just before I welcome you as our first guest for this, our 17th season, we do have to do this full disclosure thing. Remind everyone that TVO um, is... Um, well, how do we put this? TVO is a provider of the ministry's distance learning and online learning, not the agenda, the program you're on right now, not the journalism side. We have nothing to do with that, but the ILC, the Independent Learning Center, has been a distance learning partner with your ministry uh, for almost 100 years, which I think predates you a little bit. It's hard, yeah. And we put that on the record in the interest of full disclosure. Thank okay, you. from where you sit, so welcome now. Thank you. From where you stand, are Ontario schools ready to get back to quote unquote normal? Absolutely. I think it has been two exceptionally difficult years, and we owe it to children to parents and I think to the frontline staff to return these kids to some sense of normal. I mean, every jurisdiction in the modern world has done so on the basis that it's going to help with their mental and physical health and their academic success. I think we could both accept that there's been learning loss that's transpired in fundamental subjects, reading, writing, and math. Uh, globally, the data suggests that. And so how can we, from a public policy perspective, fix that gap that has emerged? And what I believe it's about in-person learning. St stability for kids will be uh, will be the driving force for their resurgence and, frankly, um, um, for um, for their success. Let me pick up on that, the learning loss, because, and I'm yeah. sure you've seen the studies, there are lots of them from the states that have come in already. Indeed. Some from here saying that the learning loss is probably the most significant we've seen in 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I don't know how many kids I've talked to who've said the last two years were a complete write-off and they learned nothing. And I don't know that they're exaggerating all that much. Right. So what do you have planned to sure. deal with that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's fair to say that, and I think that's the basis for why the government, the Premier and I have been very unequivocal in our commitment to keeping kids in school right to June without disruption. And how we define learning can't just be through the prism of in a class through instruction by an educator. A lot of kids, including you know, perhaps your own children and, and certainly for myself, learned a great deal about leadership and the development, social emotional learning, soft skills outside of class, but still within our schools, our clubs, our sports, our extracurriculars, these things matter. Um, now with respect to the question of how do we address learning loss fundamentally as a government, we announced Ontario's plan to catch up, which is literally designed on restoring um, and refocusing our learning experience on life skills and job skills. You get you, many parents or many kids say to you uh, that question, many ask me, why did I learn that, right? Why did I learn that in, this, in the curriculum? How is this gonna help me get a job, pay for a house, succeed in my life? And that's a fair question to ask their government. And I think it's about time we start to respond with a focus on skill sets that are relevant to the labor market. I find it odd, we, there's 500,000 more people working in Ontario, we create the conditions for good private sector, overwhelmingly growth in jobs, and yet we still have a stubbornly high youth unemployment rate nationally and provincially. Something's got to change, and the fix there is curriculum alignment. We have curriculum that is totally unrelated to the skill sets, math and science updated in 2005 under the former Liberals. So this, this year, this September, these kids are learning a brand new curriculum focused on those, those fundamental skills, transferable skills, coding, financial literacy, learning how to budget. Um, how about civics? Civics was just, thank you for asking, Civics, which is something for myself, a great passion to inspire the next generation to understand their government, to understand how to navigate government, to understand the principles of sound, accountable government and the constitution and some of the fundamentals okay. of Canada's history. I we just it, renewed it. I raise it because that's the kind of course that doesn't necessarily directly lead to a job, although maybe the job you've got right now, sure. but it, it tends not to directly lead to a job. So is it a reasonable question to ask 
whether or not this redo of the curriculum is a little too focused on the workplace and not enough on building the whole citizen? I meet too many parents and too many young people who say that my kid can't or I can't gain a job that is provides a dignified wage to own a home and retire one day with dignity. So we need to emphasize fundamental life skills and job skills so that when young people graduate, they actually graduate with confidence and with monetizable skills. But to your question, I agree. Learning is so much more than just the currency of a wage at the end, that's not just the metric of success. We want people to be living service oriented and frankly, um, uh, vocations beyond a job. Mm -hmm. I just simply believe by emphasizing math and STEM education, we're going to help ensure our kids have a competitive advantage. Yeah, for sure. These are good things to have. I want to do a little one of these sort of, if you knew then what you know now type of things, right? right. And hindsight, of course, is 2020. But of course, Ontario has been noteworthy over the last two and a half years by virtue of the fact that it's had its schools closed longer, I think longer than any jurisdiction in Canada, and among the lo longest in the world. And we have had concomitant learning loss as a result of that. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, was that the right call? Look, we uh, are committed when it comes to September. We can't go back, Steve, uh, frankly. When we follow medical advice, we do so using the best advice at that time when this virus was I get that, but did you learn emerging. anything as a result of closing the schools that long? I think what we learned fundamentally is that kids have a right to be in school and nothing should obstruct that, be it the pandemic or union negotiations. Uh, either way, for 30 years, to be fair, kids have faced um, you know, um, disruption in their learning because of public sector teacher education imposed unions on kids literally every three years. I mean, I'm 35 years old. I happen to be the youngest minister of education. And throughout my life, the constant is not one party in the premier's chair. We've seen them all. We've seen new Democrats, liberals, and conservatives in some sort of cycle. And yet the constant has been disruption by unions. And so the lesson learned fundamentally is kids need to be in school and they need to stay in school and we need to fight as a government to do that. And I think we've underscored a clear commitment that we will stand up for in-person learning right to June. I wasn't going to get into this yet. I was going to get to this later. But since you've opened the door, let's go right through on. it. Do you consider teachers to be essential workers? Um, well, the government believes that education and public education is essential to the life of a society and a child. Uh, th because those words carry legal meaning, right? right? That's why I'm asking them. Right, of course. So the, the government, of course, believes uh, that they provide an essential service in the sense that, you know, they're helping kids build l actual skills that can help them get a job. Right. So, so actually if they're helping providing build... an essential service, are they right. therefore essential workers? Look, we've been very clear when it, when it comes to the next question you will pose of what the government's intend to do. That's not my mandate. I think education is essential to the life of a child. I think it's critical. We can come up with a synonym that maybe is less, uh, you know, punchy. It is, it is critical. And I think we need to fight to make sure kids stay in school. My mandate is to deliver deals that provides stability, normal, stable, and more enjoyable. That's what I'm advancing. That's what the Premier and I care about most. Uh, and I just want to thank the staff who provide that critical service, that essential service, because they make a difference every day. Okay, but uh, you know, people who've had your job before you and people who've had other jobs in government before right. you, in their wisdom, have decided that there are a group of people in our society that are essential for right. the functioning of society. And whether they're the people who drive the trains on the TTC or police officers or whatever, there are some people for whom there is no right to strike because they are considered so essential. Do you think teachers belong in that category? Uh, I believe teachers need to focus on keeping kids in school in the context of this labor That's negotiation. That's not exactly what I'm asking you. Do you think right. teachers are so essential that they ought not to have the right to strike? And I believe that educators in the context of my mandate before me today should focus on keeping their kids in school. Uh, You're giving me the same answer. I am, because I believe in it and I insist upon it. But because, it's not responsive to the question. Uh, are, are teachers well, so essential that they ought not to have the right to strike? I believe that teachers should focus on keeping their kids in school. If we want to, if, let, let's, just, let's just expand the logic of the question. that. To educators are providing an important service to children. If we all accept that premise, then nothing, absolutely nothing, should uh, incent a union to walk out of a classroom or a school this year. And there are some unions who are on a path to do that, who actually commenced that path before the government even had the benefit of tabling the first offer. So I believe uh, what we do in our schools, honestly, is amazing. It, it is inspiring. And I thank the staff who work hard, the parents who give of themselves, and the kids for their focus 
and their commitments. But I do believe the most important thing we can do, the most critical action government could do, uh, is provide stability for kids through an extraordinary circumstance of the last two years. And I'm assuring parents we will do that right to June. So make them a reasonable offer. I'm sure they'll sign on and then you've got the peach that you want. That's the plan. It just requires Is 1% a reasonable offer? It requires two to tangle. Well, we've offered up to 8.24% over the course of those four years for the for workers, uh, for CUPE specifically. So that's one and a quarter percent. Uh, it'd be 2% for those uh, making under 40,000, 1.25 for those making above 40,000. Uh, of course, keeping in mind that we've also maintained the most generous pension mm -hmm. benefits, long-term disability in Canada. I don't know any worker that is uh, that is permitted as an entitlement 11 days at 100% and then an additional 100 uh, days, uh, 120 days rather, at 90%. Th that, is, that is what they have. They have the best pension in Canada and we're actually preserving it. All we're simply asking for of everyone in the system is to ensure that these kids could remain in school to support their mental and physical health. And to your earlier question, getting them back on track with respect to their academics. It's a very reasonable offer we're making. Think it'll get it done? You know, I think a lot of people at uh, this juncture two years ago when we were uh, in round one of our labor negotiations uh, didn't think it could be done, frankly. Different and, time, very and, different time. Teachers weren't going to walk out at the beginning of an international pandemic. We, we seem to, well, you've just told us we're in more normal times right now, so the, the groundwork right. is not quite the same. I think, um, you know, I think uh, if anyone's sort of embracing uh, the values and the voices of parents, they'll know that there's never the right time to walk out, certainly after two years of learning loss in children and mental health, the accumulation of real mental health impacts on kids. Okay. And therefore, I believe the right thing to do on a moral basis, given that we're all in this for kids, right? That's ostensibly what we got into this business to do for all of us, for the unions, the trustees, the education, the government, et cetera, is to make sure that kids are not out of school. And I think a fundamental question I've not heard an answer to is, you know, I've heard like, worry not, the teacher unions will say, the kids will be in school in September. But then they're very specific in narrowing that down to the early weeks. I, I want a commitment for stability, and I want that to be right to June. Let's have an, a very spirited debate at the table. It's okay to disagree. Frank, frank, factually, the government of the day under every premier and the new unions have opposed and disagreed vigorously for 30 years. Mm -hmm. All I ask is that kids remain at the center of this debate, and they do not, they do not in any way uh, have an impact imposed on them. Okay. Let's circle back to some of the discussion around COVID-19. Sure. Dr. Moore, the Medical Officer of Health for the province, has said that if someone continues to test positive for COVID, but they're feeling better for 24 hours, they can go back to school. As the Minister of Education, responsible for 2 million kids? Right. You comfortable with that? Uh, I continue to have confidence and support the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health based on the best emerging evidence uh, that is before us. And I think, look, we want to return to normal. Many jurisdictions in the world and in this country have adopted a similar program. We continue to provide rapid tests. Uh, we're one of the jurisdictions that did this first in Canada. In fact, the, we were the first um, that provide rapid tests for symptomatic purposes for both the students and the staff. And we also have more frontline staff, more cleaning staff. We've enhanced that right across the board. There's literally 5,000 more staff in our schools to support uh, the safety and the safe return. So the point in short is, yes, I believe it is fundamental and foundational as we try to sort of spur a resurgence or a rebirth uh, of a young person when it comes to why they're in school in the first place. Um, it's really to make sure that they could be in the most normal setting while still having those health and safety elements like the ventilation and the HEPA filtration, which in Ontario is literally leading in this country. Let me uh, see if I can draw you out a little more on that just to see what your thinking is. Because, uh, and I think it's fair to say that the COVID-19 of today, thankfully, yes. is not the same fatal uh, virus that it was two and a half years ago when we were caught unawares and uh, really unprepared for it. Mm -hmm. Because of that, do you think that we now ought to be treating students and or teachers and or education workers who contract the disease more along the lines of as if they were having a flu as opposed to COVID-19? Look, I think parents will make individual decisions based on their own personal risk, 
what we've done is we've created an environment where kids can wear a mask or not should they want it's a safe space to do so we've encouraged immunization encourage educators um, parents rather to speak to their, to their physicians their pediatricians it's not a mandate we have mandated though the highest ventilation standards in the country we've mandated the highest cleaning standards we've also increased the amount of investment in people more EAs and custodians and educators to make a difference within our schools this is all developed with the singular aim of in-person learning being restored from September to June without no, disruption. I get that, I get that, but every medical person I've talked to says, mm -hmm. we're fine right now, but it's summertime. It's 20 plus degrees outside. Once the weather gets worse, right. once COVID makes a comeback, which everybody is anticipating, right. what kind of things might you need to see before making a recommendation to the Premier that we may have to look at lockdowns and school closures again? The government has been entirely clear. Our commitment is to keeping kids in school. We will do whatever it takes to ensure that. Um, these kids have paid, uh, borne a great deal of impact over the past two years, and it is incumbent on everyone involved to insist that kids remain in school. So there we are have, no conditions that you can imagine that would warrant closing down schools? We're laying out a clear, unambiguous commitment to in-person learning. Well, of course, Steve continued to follow the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, but he, himself said, and I quote, I'm confident that this school year will be just that safe and healthy last week. The Children's Health Coalition echoed similar context of the necessity of in-person learning without disruption, which represents all the major pediatric hospitals in this province. We agree with the medical community. Kids need to be in school and stay in school, and we will fight to ensure they do. I know you're not the colleges and universities minister. You're responsible for everybody before they get to post-secondary. Right. But we do notice that Western has decided that anybody who wants to go on campus has got to be triple vaxxed and wear a mask to go to a class. That's, that's, I mean, that's putting a marker down pretty unequivocally. Why, why do you think it's okay for Western, but that's not a, a marker that you want to follow for the pre-secondary? Well, you have to ask that institution because that's not the, pro the program or expectation in every post-secondary right. uh, in the province, as you know. Uh, all I know is that the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province, including the local Medical Officer of Health in London himself, strongly believes that in-person learning is critical. And we have brought forth a program with more mental health, with a tutoring expansion program to help kids with catch up, with more cleaning, with screening, and of course with rapid tests and ventilation standards that are, that are unmatched in this province, in this country. I think that is all brought forth over two years of incremental progress to get us to a point where we can confidently look a parent in the eye and say we have done everything humanly possible. We are leading in virtually every metric when it comes to risk mitigation. Mm -hmm. And I believe firmly, I, as a matter of philosophy, on a moral basis, from an academic and from a health and safety, you talk to those physicians and you look at the challenges of mental health and the impacts on young kids, eating disorder data, it is honestly very no, staggering and deeply disturbing. For sure. We have an obligation to keep kids in school. And I'm saying to families that together, if we as individuals, for parents watching, if they could exercise an element of caution, make sure their kids are truly screened, keep them home if they are sick, if we do some responsible individual choices, uh, we can ensure that these kids remain in school and it would be of great benefit for them. Let me ask you in our last 30 seconds here, and admittedly it's a bit of a touchy-feely question, but, sure. but you, you, you've got one of the big jobs in cabinet, right? Two million kids thousands of schools all over the province. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, as the cliche goes, when the head hits the pillow, what do you worry about that's on your watch? I think most uh, especially uh, is the future of young people in this economy. Uh, the disruptions in this economy, the changes in landscape when it comes to housing affordability, the displacement of jobs through technology and AI, it really comes down to what is the quality of life and the economic future of a child in Ontario if you're a five or a seven year old? What is what is 15 and 25 years look down the road? And I think what we're doing when it comes to modernizing the curriculum, emphasizing STEM, life and job skills, budgeting, financial literacy, coding, understanding AI, learning about a visa or a mortgage or pay, learning how to pay taxes, those are skill sets, frankly, that I think generations of kids wish they learned, that they finally will under our government. And so when it comes to the problem, Conversely, there is a solution, and we can in empower these kids to learn skills that I think are going to help them succeed. It's, again, not just through the, the, the currency of wages. Yeah. It's about giving them a quality of life where they could perhaps own a home and support their kids in their post-secondary or skilled trades ambitions. I want these families, these young people, to grow up with that fire in their belly to be hopeful and optimistic. And I think for some young people, it's frankly one of the reasons why I ran four years ago, a lot of young people in this province and this country, I'd submit, 
lost that, you know, that desire to uh, to be ambitious because it was so difficult. I mean, like, who the heck could afford a million dollar home even a couple years ago? It had almost seemed like the system was designed against so many young people. And I, I think what is frankly empowering is to see young people in governments at all levels stepping up because we've got skin in the game. And I like that the system of education under our government is really focusing on the skill set that are going to help them succeed, not just when it comes to the jobs, but even the social emotional learning skills, the mental health skill sets, learning how to debate civilly. You talked about civics, learning about misinformation and the abuse of information online when it comes to creating a democratic society where young people actually know what is le legitimate and what is quote unquote fake news, if I could invoke that, that, that verb. I've heard it said before. And so that's, but those are skill sets necessary in the future of a prosperous a country and a democracy. Mm -hmm. And we need both. That's the Minister of Education for the province of Ontario, Stephen Lecce. We thank you for helping us kick off our 17th season here on TVO. Appreciate thank you being here. Thank you so much. Some universities in Ontario require masks and students to be triple vaxxed this fall. Public schools require neither. And last week, the government changed the rules on how long people need to isolate when they contract COVID. Answer, not as long. As the school year for all begins, do we need a more unified approach to these mandates? Let's ask. In the nation's capital, Dr. Neely Kaplan-Mirth, a family physician in Ottawa. And here in our studio, Dr. Matt Strauss. He's acting medical officer of health for the region of Haldeman, Norfolk in southwestern Ontario. He's also a critical care physician. And Dr. Maxwell Smith is here, a bioethicist who sat on Ontario's Vaccine Task Force. He's an assistant professor at Western University's Faculty of Health Sciences. And it's great to welcome you two here in the studio and Dr. Kaplan Mirth in the nation's capital to our program tonight. I want to start, uh, okay, Ottawa, let's start with you. It's become clear that the message from the provincial government is we're all getting back to normal now, folks. So let's start there. Are we back to normal yet? No. So the language that you use when you say something like uh, normal is a far right um, language of anti-maskers, anti-vaxxers and ableists who uh, disregard the impact of COVID on on seniors, on children, on educators, on essential workers, on healthcare workers, on our healthcare crisis. Uh, there's nothing normal about getting COVID, repeated infections, children and adults being hospitalized and long COVID. There's nothing normal about taking away the protections and the proactive measures that we had to help to reduce transmission of COVID. And there's nothing normal about uh, getting rid of any kind of isolation requirements, which would have helped to curtail outbreaks in schools, in workplaces and everywhere else that you go. Okay, let me do a quick follow up with you. And I mean, no disrespect in asking this, but we've obviously done hundreds of programs during the course of COVID-19. And I don't think we've ever had a guest who kept their mask on during the interview. So again, with, without yeah. prejudice, I merely ask, how come you're wearing yours now? So let me explain. So I'm a doctor. I'm a family doctor. I see patients in my office. I just had patients who are in my office with their babies, and I have more patients coming in this afternoon. COVID is airborne. That means that COVID remains in the air even after you've left the room. I keep my mask on. It is a way to protect myself. It's a way to protect my patients. It's a way to protect my staff and the community. It is what healthcare providers across the world are saying that we should be doing and it's really not a hardship i wear my mask from the moment that i arrive in my office in the morning until the end of the day it's a simple safe effective measure gotcha okay dr matt strauss you've heard what dr kaplan mirth had to say i'd like you to react to that if you would off the top all right i think um 2023 and will, will not be like 2019 um uh, there's a proverb a man never steps in the same river twice um we will approach something like normal, but it'll be a different normal. That's understandable. I think that for those Ontarians who have had COVID, and that's the majority of Ontarians at this point, and for the vast, vast majority of them, they experienced it as a head cold or a, a bad flu. Um, for most of them, they, they yearn to return to normal. And I don't think that there's anything far right about that. I think they want to see their kids in sports. They want to see their kids making friends at school. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't, I would be, um, I would be slow to attach nefarious political motivations to that desire to go back to life as we knew it. Have you had COVID? I have. I had it a month ago. And how was it? 
Um, I was quite uncomfortable for about 24 hours. Um, and after that, I had the sniffles for about three or four days. Um, my, my wife had it, my baby had it, and uh, everyone did, did, did well, uh, about as you would experience a cold uh, back in 2017. You would acknowledge that lots of people have died from this, and therefore we may need to treat it more severely than the average flu. Absolutely, and we have treated more severely. Not only have I acknowledged it, I've taken care of um, uh, dozens if not hundreds of patients with COVID-19 in hospitals and critical care units now, some of whom unfortunately died. So that's why I'm so thankful that we have had an amazing vaccine program. We have amazing treatments like Paxlovid and Evusheld. Um, and, and because of these amazing treatments, we can look forward to getting back to normal. Okay, Maxwell Smith, I'm gonna ask you, you're a bioethicist, so you come at this, uh, I, I guess, from a somewhat different perspective. What do you think the Ford government's approach to COVID-19 nowadays tells us about their value judgments? So think back to the very beginning of the pandemic and think of the terms or phrases that were ubiquitous. We're all in this together, solidarity, I think what we're seeing with this downloading of, of how we're thinking about the pandemic to personal responsibility is a retreat from solidarity and the idea that we're all in this together. It's, it's more like you're on your own. Um, so I, I think what we're really seeing is, is once the vast majority of us, as Dr. Strauss mentioned, have had COVID, perhaps are healthy enough, have it, uh, enough av advantage to think that they're no longer at risk. Um, they're happy with the removal of measures, even if that means that some of the most vulnerable among us are, are still affected gravely. They do say that politics is the art of the possible. And one of the things that politicians uh, like to think that they're pretty good at is sort of, you know, picking up where the wind is blowing and understanding what the public is kind of prepared to or not prepared to do. Do you think let me offer a different interpretation and you tell me what you think. As opposed to you're all on your own, is it possible the Ford government is simply saying, you know, the public's really had enough of this and therefore we're gonna dial it down? Yeah, I think that's certainly part of it. And, you know, trying to meet the public where they're at is an important input to decision-making. It ought not to be dispositive of what we do. Practical challenges that we face, perhaps the public isn't willing to move with us or are, aren't on board with some measures are certainly important, but they, not, they shouldn't nullify our ethical obligations to protect the public from health and reduce inequity. So we need to be aware of how the public's thinking, but that shouldn't tell us necessarily what we ought to do. Dr. kaplan so, can I just circle back to your yeah. first answer, which, which, which did have some fairly tough language about you know, far right talking yeah. points and that so kind of stuff. Yeah, so let me just respond to what um, both of uh, my colleagues have just said. So willful, willful ignorance and denial is a failure um, of providing information to the public. What we've said to the public is COVID is over when COVID is not over. What we've said to the public is, well, you've just been infected, so now you're fine, but we know that that's not true. In fact, we've had patients who have been repeatedly infected and who are gonna suffer long-term consequences in terms of cardiac, respiratory, cognitive, endocrine and other ramifications um, in their lives. We already have a government that does not care about disability, that does not do anything to support people who have long-term chronic illnesses. And we have a situation in which we're not providing the metrics, we're withholding data, we're, not, we're no longer allowing um, uh, teachers to report cases in classrooms. We're no longer allowing family doctors to be uh, doing PCR testing. We're no longer uh, collecting any of the information that would actually provide the public with the required knowledge to make informed decisions. And let so me just ask the obvious doing, follow -up. Okay, hang on. No, though. please let don't interrupt me. Let me just finish. Let, let me just finish this. This is a really important message. COVID is not over, and the number of people who are going to be reinfected because we've dropped all of our measures, all of our preventative measures, and we've dropped all of our metrics for reporting on COVID is going to lead to a worsening of the healthcare crisis and it's gonna to lead to a worsening of COVID in our communities affecting every single one of us and disproportionately affecting vulnerable populations, people with disabilities, people who live in poverty, people who have to work because they do not have the financial ability to stay home when they're sick. Dr. Strauss, you want to take that on? Yeah, I don't think that um, the plan that the Chief Medical Officer of Health has outlined uh, is in any way willfully ignorant. 
Um, I think that we, of course, want to protect vulnerable members of our society, and certainly no one has said COVID is over. I wish that COVID would be over. COVID will never be over. The Spanish flu of 1918-1919 killed a terrible number of people, and it's with us today. Uh, H1N1, the, the, um, the flu pandemic of 2009, is a descendant of that flu. So I wish it would go away. I wish COVID would go away, but it's not going away. And so we have to be realistic and talk about measures that we understand to be effective um, and engage in those measures. We engaged in a lot of, I think, cruel and coercive measures this past winter in like terms what? of uh, vaccine mandates, um, in terms of uh, capacity restrictions, school closures, lockdowns. And what we found was everyone, not everyone, but the majority of Ontarians got COVID anyway. So I don't think that it's ignorant to um, decide not to double down on restrictive measures that have been proven ineffective. Maxwell Smith, what do you say? Last year, the 2020-2021 influenza season, uh, Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada have reported that they had no evidence of community transmission or circulation of influenza, largely due to the measures that we had in place for COVID. That's not to say, as Dr. Strauss mentioned, that the sorts of measures that we, that we put in place, whether it's stay-at-home orders, school closures, and so forth, are warranted or justified, but clearly there is a trade-off between not having any circulation of influenza and perhaps uh, blunting the transmission of COVID and some of these other effects. The question is, what are we willing to accept as a society moving forward? Are we willing to live with the amount of death hospitalization and illness from COVID and other uh, respiratory illnesses? Um, or are we willing to put up with some measures, perhaps better ventilation, filtration, wearing masks when appropriate to avert those sorts of negative outcomes? You were shaking your head rather vigorously there. Right. It's not a matter of can I accept this number of deaths. It's a, it's a, number, it's a matter of what is the delta? What is, can I, what is the minimal achievable number of deaths? So it, there, there's some absolute number of deaths that we can't change. And it's like the old prayer, um, you know, God give me the courage to change the things that I can change and the, the wisdom to accept the things that I can't. So some number of those deaths we can't change. We've tried everything. We've tr thrown the kitchen sink at this problem. And I would like to see us double down on, on those measures that are effective, like the vaccines and the treatments, and, and just to let go of those things that have turned out to be ineffective. Uh, uh, so it's I just... probably... It's patently untrue what both of you are saying about masks being ineffective. In fact, the state of Massachusetts in February lifted mask mandates and any um, schools that had lifted mask mandates with the exception of Boston and Chelsea, um, any schools that lifted mask mandates saw the transmission go up by 30%. Those schools that maintained mask mandates saw an appreciable difference in the amount of COVID that was spread within classrooms. We have the tools to use. We know what we can use. We have masks and they should be N95 masks. We should be using HEPA filters. We should be improving ventilation. We should be providing adequate paid sick days and encouraging people to stay home when they're sick rather than returning to workplaces. We have all of those tools. They are achievable. They are low cost. They are effective. It is inappropriate to say that masks are some form of harm hardship. They are not. They are not cruelty, Matt. They are not in any way restricting people's ability to make friends, to play, to work, to do any of the things. In fact, there are places in the world where even, uh, for example, in Italy, opera singers are on stage wearing masks. There is nothing that you are saying that that is based in science or medicine. What you are saying is based in right-wing, anti-mask, anti-vax ideology, which has been your calling card throughout the pandemic. All right, let's let him respond. Sorry, I miss, you, said, uh, you said something and then anti-mask, anti-vaccine? Uh, Right-wing, maybe? Right-wing, oh, okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> what I'm saying very clearly is you have stood with people. You were part of the, the push to politicize and to to use the terms restrict and freedom and all of this terminology that is really i mean vaccines vaccine mandates are quite normal we've always had them school boards require that students are immunized against measles mumps rubella chicken pox meningitis it's a normal thing as a family doctor every year i keep my 
all of my patients up to date with all of their routine immunizations. If you're a doctor and you want to go to medical school, the first thing you have to do, if you're a nurse and you want to go to nursing school, the first thing you have to do is prove that you are up to date with all of your immunizations. That is just basic public health and it's basic sense. Okay, let's let him respond. So you've, you've made some accusations against me that are patently untrue. Uh, I'm certainly not anti-vaccine. I've done a lot of work over the last year to promote vaccines. In the community that I've served, I've greatly increased the vaccination rate. I've promoted vaccines twice during my appearance on this program. So it's really inappropriate to tag me with um, things that aren't true and don't represent my views or the views of science. Um, it's also inappropriate to say that I, I, I said patently untrue things such as masks are ineffective. We can roll back the tape. I didn't say masks are ineffective. I've always worn a mask in certain clinical situations throughout my 20 years in healthcare. Um, we want people to wear masks in a appropriate settings and we want them to wear appropriate masks. You um, mentioned a series from Boston, a case series from Boston that I'm not uh, familiar with. I don't believe that that data would have been randomized. I think the data that I um, spend the, pay the most attention to is the Bangladeshi trial where they randomized 380,000 people um, to masks versus not by village and found that there was about a 10% reduction in uh, transmission in those villages that were randomized to masks. So it's, a, it's pretty standard when we read the medical literature to privilege um, randomized control data, such as that Abeluk paper from Bangladesh. Um, and a 10% effectiveness rate is not terribly effective. So yes, masks are somewhat effective and we have to make decisions um, with that knowledge in hand, not the uncontrolled or unrandomized data that uh, Dr. Kaplan Murth has mentioned here. Let me get the ethicist in on that. And I'll get your view on to what extent you believe that the mandates that have been in place over the last two and a half years have, in your judgment, seriously restricted Canadians' freedoms. Well, in, in one sense, they have, right? Uh, we don't have unfettered freedom. So in fact, there are many things in our lives that restrict or otherwise intervene or infringe upon our freedoms. The question is wh whether those infringements are justified. And that is uh, an important ethical question that comes down to whether those measures or those mandates are necessary to achieve important aims. We're in a pandemic and masks and vaccines are capable are, of achieving really important public health aims and whether they're proportionate to the threat. If we were, requir were requiring vaccinations for pathogens that aren't circulating, one might think that's a disproportionate intervention uh, to try to um, fix that particular issue or achieve particular aims. However, in the context of a pandemic, when we are experiencing large amounts of community transmission, where we have very effective vaccines and effective masks, then it becomes por proportionate and necessary to use those tools in order to achieve those aims. And if mandates are required in order to do so, then they can be ethically justified. Would you acknowledge there has been some what they call pandemic theater going on during the course of the last two and a half years? Absolutely. And, and part of that is because people simply aren't aware of what may or may not work, right? There, there is evidence about the spread of the virus uh, via fomitase on, on surfaces, right? We know that that's not the dominant route of, of transmission of this virus. We know, as Dr. kaplan Murth said, that the, that the virus is airborne. And so by using hand sanitizer and plexiglass and other sorts of measures that, uh, that we used in early 2020, those might have some effect in reducing transmission, but clearly if we're using those and not some of the, the interventions that would interrupt transmission via the air, then that would seem or at least appear to be more theater. If we were really invested in stopping the circulation of this virus, then we would invest in those measures that we know are capable of doing so given the roots of transmission. Dr. Strauss, can you give me an example of something you thought was pandemic theater that at the end of the day was pretty useless? I think when they barricaded High Park so that people couldn't walk around and take pictures of the cherry blossoms, that was pretty ridiculous. Um, I, I think we're, we're probably going to talk about Western mandate, uh, Western's mandate coming mm -hmm. up. I, I think that is not based on the science and, and ultimately pandemic theater. Uh, and, and ultimately, I, I agree with Dr. Smith that um, it, it does come down to judgment. There's going to be evidence. There's going to be different things that are more or less appropriate at different times during the pandemic. And we, we need to balance the, the potential harms and the potential benefits. So we, we want good measures and not um, things that are done for optics. Dr. Kaplan-Murth, would you agree that when you say to people, you can't go into a public park or you can't play tennis outdoors, or thousands of people can crowd into a Walmart, but five people can't go into a small business, would you agree that that sends out a problematic message that does not encourage adherence? So 
those messages that have come from public health right from the beginning have lacked transparency and they have been absolutely confusing. Uh, the, the fact that we have prioritized opening malls but not prioritized safety in schools, that we have locked seniors into their retirement homes and long-term care facilities while um, pretending that nothing is going on in the community. None of that is good messaging. And it is public health's responsibility to get a clear message to the public that COVID is airborne, that there are measures that we can all undertake in order to help to prevent transmission and that we can uh, we, we should be masking indoors and we should be avoiding large crowds outdoors where you can also get COVID. If you're going to be in crowds outdoors, it's also appropriate to mask. There are very few people who would have had problem with that. And I mean, that's, I think, one of the saddest things about um, all of the misinformation and the minimizers. I had said that I was not going to come on today's panel if you were going to have a minimizer and you brought the um, greatest minimizer of all to this panel today. I am... Um, really here to fight for my patients, for the people who work in the grocery stores, for the people who work in daycares, for the people who are teachers, for the people who are children, who are struggling, who are so short of breath because they've been infected with COVID two and three and four times. I am here to represent all of the people who do not have the privilege of just working from home in a suit and, and um, avoiding interactions with the public because their work is essential work and they're out there in the community. But they no longer have the power to say that masks should be required because public health has undermined that message. It's not a big ask to say to prioritize prevention, to be proactive, especially in the context of a healthcare crisis. Okay, can you, you tell me this? Why is public health... What Tell me, tell me this, Dr. kaplan -Berth, why do you think public health has undermined that message? I mean, surely they're in the business of encouraging public health. So why do you so think they're doing the Ontario, opposite? In Ontario, the politicians have pandered to a very small group of people who occupied our streets in Ottawa, who have gone around spreading misinformation like wildfire via social media and other um, rag magazines. And, and people are um, getting all of this information from um, people who are anti-science, anti-democracy, and honestly, they're, they're um, left not sure what to do because the public health units themselves had said to us, they can't push back against the Ontario government because that is their boss. Well, I, so I, I, public I'm just health can't speak out, uh, but they tell us that it's gonna be really bad in the fall, and we, we are um, the ones who have to take Take on the burden of our sick patients, and also we have to continue to try to be able to work despite the healthcare crisis, where we are understaffed, where doctors and nurses and personal support workers and others are all put at risk. Okay, but I, I, I know. Let's get all the facts on the table here. I also note that the, the current premier of Ontario uh, kicked out a number of people from his caucus because they wouldn't get vaccines. Uh, declined to sign the nomination papers of others who refused to get vaccines and therefore he wouldn't allow them to run for his party. I mean, he's he, he's gotten in trouble. He called the people who you say he's in league with a bunch of yahoos on the south lawn of Queen's Park because they were fighting vaccinations. Uh, are you only telling half the story here? I'm sorry, but with all due respect, the premier's daughter is a avid anti-vaxxer and we all know that. But that's not Let's the premier. Let's just be honest. Yeah, but you know what? The premier doesn't show up. The premier does not show up and does not say to the public very clearly, you should be getting all the doses of the vaccine that you're eligible for. Instead, we have had to fight. We've had to fight to get that vaccine out to vulnerable populations. We've had to fight to get the booster doses for children. We've had to fight every step of the way. I have to have a panel with the Prime Minister to talk about this across Canada. It's not an Ontario-specific issue. It's really across the country, and it's around the world. But we're dealing with the same uh, wave after wave after wave of preventable COVID because our leaders are not doing what they should in providing very clear messaging. And well, it's not okay. about restrictions, and it's not about lockdowns. It's about being proactive. It's about using the tools that we have. Okay, let me give an example here of something, of some institution that's being proactive, and I'm going to see if I can get Maxwell Smith in trouble with uh, his employer here. Uh, the university that you work for, Western University in London, has decided that you've got to be triple vaxxed and wear a mask if you want to go on campus. 
uh, this week. I guess uh, classes are starting to come back this very week. Do you think this is the right move? So first of all, I, I should note at the outset, this is not an anomalous move. Western University is not an outlier. It may seem so in Ontario, but if we look to many institutions in the United States, including almost all of the Ivy League institutions, they all require three doses of vaccine. So a lot of smart people have looked at this and arrived at the, the same conclusion. I think to evaluate Western's decision, we need to look at the objectives that they want to achieve. If they said, the group of 18 to 21 year olds, the 38 th some odd thousand of them that come to Western's campus are at dire risk of severe illness from COVID-19 and that's why we are requiring vaccines. That may not make much sense. What their objective is, is to, uh, and I'm quoting here, preserve the in-person experience. They know that three doses of vaccine and everyone having to wear masks will reduce the risk of infection. It won't eliminate it, but it will lower that risk. How much risk are, is, is sufficient to warrant such a mandate? People will fall down on different ends of that spectrum. For Western University and apparently in consultation with experts and students and others, they felt that in order to preserve that experience, in order to lower risk uh, enough so that we can continue with the in-person experience, this was justified. You went to Western, didn't you? I did, I spent nine years there. It was the time of my life. Um, I feel very passionate about that school and that's why I chose to speak out about why I think this is the incorrect mandate at an incorrect time. Um, I do agree with Dr. Smith that um, reasonable people could say, well, if it cuts down on transmission, then perhaps it would be a good mandate. And, and Western is an independent institution. It could make that sort of argument. It hasn't made that sort of argument. It can't make that sort of argument because it's not in line with the, our best scientific understanding right now, which is that after about f four months after your booster, it's roughly 0% effective at preventing transmission. And I posted those papers on my Twitter. Um, it's, I think it's in Nature Communications in the Journal of the American Med Medical Association. Um, so it doesn't make sense to say if Jill had her vaccine eight months ago, her booster, and Jack didn't, uh, and Jill's vaccine is, prov is providing 0% protection against transmission that we're kicking Jack out and denying him the opportunity to learn science at the University of Western Ontario, denying everyone the opportunity to challenge each other and debate these issues at an open institution that a university should be. Um, I think that it's it's A, not scientific, and B, not in keeping with the, the character of an, of an open institution that a university ought to be. Why do you think they're doing it? Um, I think it kind of goes back to the issue of pandemic theater. I think that um, some folks who maybe aren't as up to date on the literature think that this is a measure who will that that will prevent transmission, which unfortunately is just not the case. Um, and and I and then honestly, to some extent, I find some of it mean spirited, particularly in the way that it was done two weeks before classes start, when tuition was already paid, leases were signed, and other offers for um, uh, uh, educational opportunities were declined. So. Throughout the pandemic, I've been calling for kindness, calm, uh, and consent, and there has been a bit of a streak of, of fear, panic, anger, and coercion. Well, okay. First of all, uh, one thing, uh, apologies to our viewers and listeners who may be able to hear that, I don't know who, but somebody's banging on the pipes up there and it's really annoying, but we'll, we'll power through here. The second thing is, mm, can I, can I ask if you're being a bit precious on this in as much as you did send out a tweet once upon a time saying, if I had a choice, I'd rather have COVID than go eat a Happy Meal at McDonald's. That's not precisely to what I said. No, it, okay, um, but but you get the drift. Hang on, no, let's no, no. let him answer. Just, hang on, no. hang on. Let's okay. Tell us what you said. Um, so two years ago, I wrote a tweet thread about um, other risks to the public health, other risks to children's health. It was a data-intensive thread that included a lot of data about childhood obesity, my concerns about hyperpalatable food and hyperprocessed food. And again, also, what can I do to change the risks for myself and my family and what can I not do? I think that, unfortunately, my family getting COVID was rather inevitable. It took two and a half years, but it finally happened. Whereas I can choose what sort of nutrition to provide my daughter. Um, and so that's what I wrote at that time. A lot of people took it not in the way I intended it. So I took it down two years ago. Um, because as a writer, as a commentator, I want to say truths that people are ready to hear. Um, but uh, it, it was something true and it, the, the, the facts of that matter um, still stand. Okay, Dr. kaplan Murth, you wanted it. Yeah, so actually I wanted to just touch on the um, the word that you use about fear, because one of the things that trolls and all the people who are um, so um, eager to attack uh, physicians who advocate for preventative and proactive strategies, what they love to say is that we're fear mongers. Well, let me just explain that as a doctor, my job is to keep my patients healthy. My job is to keep the community healthy. And to talk about 
wearing masks and getting vaccines and staying home when sick and providing adequate paid sick days and dealing with structural inequalities that leave our most vulnerable people in our population uh, at risk of getting COVID repeatedly is not fear mongering. That is called taking care of each other. And actually, I want to go back to something that um, our colleague uh, said about um, about the importance of uh, teaching uh, empathy and teaching civic responsibility and teaching our uh, next generation that it's really important to do what you what what you can not only because it satisfies what you want in that moment but because it's about taking care of other people so if we go back to the idea of we're in this together if we go back to the idea of truly caring about each other it is not a huge thing to ask people to mask and acknowledge that um it is uh, there's no specificity in terms of the signs and symptoms of COVID that would help people to do symptom-based screening to say, oh, well, I have COVID, so I shouldn't go out. We've now gotten rid of any isolation requirements. We've gotten rid of masks. All of those, all of those preventative measures that we've dropped mean that you are making a choice for the rest of us. When you go out, you decide, well, you've had COVID once and you don't care if you get it again, but I care deeply. If you give my patient who is already struggling to breathe walking down the block, I care deeply if you cause my 95 year old in long-term care to be locked in again. And I care deeply if you cause my nurse colleagues to get sick on the job or to have to leave their jobs because they're burned out because they're working in understaffed environments because COVID has run rampant. Okay, let me so get some, let me get- What you need to do let me get some feedback the in the studio. You need to take away the fear mongering and you need to start talking about civic responsibility and empathy. Okay, uh, Maxwell Smith, tell me this. Is it possible that honorable people can look at the same data and come to different conclusions? And it's not to say one's right, one is right and one is wrong, but honorable people can disagree. Well, there, there can be disagreement about evidence on its own, but the true disagreement is about the value judgments we, we make in response to that, that data. Data, science, evidence doesn't tell us what to do. We know that if we eliminate all cars in Toronto, we would eliminate pedestrian deaths from motor vehicles. But we balance, we, we don't think that's acceptable because we also find it convenient to get to work on time and travel somewhat fast. And so even where the science is, is quite clear and we agree upon it, we can still have disagreements based on our value judgments. So I think what we're hearing here is a privileging of uh, a freedom to do whatever one wants versus uh, a value of protecting the public from harm and reducing inequities. There is a balance there, as I mentioned, with the flu season. We had no community circulation. Mm -hmm. That's possible, but perhaps not, not warranted. Most people wouldn't find that acceptable. But clearly at this point where we're experiencing deaths, hospitalization, and illness from COVID, there are things we could do without thereby sacrificing anything else of significant moral importance. In my last 30 seconds here, Dr. Strauss, I cannot recall a time when we had more people contacting our station saying, please don't have him on, meaning you. Okay. Why do you think that is? Uh, Fear-based messaging is not working the way that it used to, and more people are open to the line of thinking that I've been offering um, from the outset. Um, but I, some people are still caught in a very 2020 mindset, I guess I would say, and, and determined to attack and declare as misinformation uh, evidence-based views with which they disagree. And with that, we are going to th express our thanks for a very robust yet civilized discussion tonight here on TVO with Dr. Neely Kaplan-Mirth, Maxwell Smith, and Dr. Matt Strauss. Thanks to the three of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. You're Thank very you, Steve. After the disruption of the last few years, college and university students head back to in-person school with COVID still in the air. With us from Thunder Bay, Ontario, for a student's perspective on the year ahead, let's welcome Mitra Yakubi, chair of the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario and a student at the University of Toronto. And Mitra, we're happy to have you back on our airwaves. And I want to start by just asking you, what do you think students have missed the most over the last couple of years? Thank you so much, Steve, for having me again on the show. Um, I think some of the things that students have missed out on the past two years have just been that holistic university experience, given that, you know, 
they haven't been able to go to their campuses. They haven't been able to interact with their classmates, uh, their professors, their TAs, uh, and other community members in the same way. So I think there is like a missing of that feeling, just being able to go to university and connect with folks. Uh, I think folks were having a really difficult time just making those connections as they happen naturally on our campuses. Uh, but also they've had to miss out on some hands-on experiences when it came to like labs and being able to have that one-on-one -on -one interaction and things like that. Uh, so I think there was a little bit of like that missing out. Uh, and beyond that, I think some students were also struggling with having a space, like a quiet space at home for those that weren't able to study, uh, at, that didn't have that study space at home, just struggling finding a place to study uh, and keeping up with their studies. like the past two years because of that interrupted learning. Well, you're coming to Toronto later this week to start your schooling again at the U of T, at the Monk School. And um, are you nervous? A little bit. Um, <laughs> I think there is a little bit of anxiety in terms of what to expect from school, given that I haven't been in fully in-person learning since 2019. Now, I gather most students in the province of Ontario have had to pay full tuition, despite the fact that they haven't had access to their campuses or a lot of classroom instruction. Is that your understanding as well? Yeah, that is actually our experiences. Like even during my undergraduate time, we were still being charged full tuition fees despite the fact that we were going through online learning. Uh, and beyond that, I think something that was really shameful was that international students still saw an increase in their tuition fees in the midst of a pandemic. So we were going through a pandemic, but students were still being charged thousands of dollars to be in these institutions. And we know that that tuition fees make education so much less accessible for students who are already struggling paying all the things that they have to pay for. Now, you know, the post-secondary institution argument would be, we know you're not getting to the classes, we know you're not getting to the campuses, we know you're not doing the extracurriculars, but you're still getting the piece of paper at the end of the day. So they say you should have to pay the full freight. What do you think of that argument? I think there are a few ways to think about it. Uh, as an institution, our most important priority needs to be students. And we need to think about, did we do that during the pandemic? Were we supporting students in the way that they deserve to be supported? Given that they were going through a pandemic, trying to get through their academic responsibilities, and also doing all the things that they have to do. Uh, so that's, that's my take on it. I think we need to be more intentional in the way that we're treating students in our institutions and the way that we're supporting them uh, because students have been struggling for the past two years. Let me, okay, you ready to get into some controversy here? Should we go for this? Sure. Okay, most post-secondary schools, as you well know, have dropped the mandatory vaxxing and masking. Western University in London has not. They're still adamant that if you want to attend class, you got to have three vaccinations and a mask. What do you think of that? I think when it comes to like COVID uh, safety protocols and restrictions and things like that, they are important in a lot of ways because they keep ourselves, they keep our communities and students that are the most vulnerable and most impacted by the pandemic safe. But at the same time, when it comes to mandates, there is this other side where it does also negatively impact some students, like the marginalized students on our campuses who may have been more policed in terms of like whether they were they had a vaccination or they were masking and things like that. So we have to be really careful when we're thinking about that. Uh, and also in terms of vaccine requirements and mandates, I think it's just been a really difficult time for international students, especially given that some of them have had to take four or five doses of the vaccine because what they had back home was not accepted by the government here. So I think there is a difficulty in like processing and going through these uh, mandates. But in our last 20 seconds here, are you saying you think every post-secondary institution should do what Western's doing? I think regardless of the decision that institutions are making, it needs to be an opportunity for folks to be able to uh, have students in the table when they're making that decision. Uh, I think student voices have not been heard, student voices have not been consulted, and it's important for them to be part of that decision-making process. It's really important for us to advocate for 
at for flexible learning opportunities for all students so no student is left behind as we return back to our campuses and to just ensure that all students are supported throughout this process because we may be done with the pandemic but the pandemic is not done with us well you've been heard on this program tonight mitra and we're glad you could join us again and don't be nervous you're going to be fantastic this year have a good time at u of t thank you so much and that is the agenda for Tuesday, September 6, 2022, the first episode of this, our 17th season on TVO. Tomorrow, why so many municipal politicians are heading for the exits and why that's raising concerns about local democracy. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow.